So we take great pride here at New York Presbyterian Wild Cornell Breast Center in offering people the most up-to-date and advanced techniques, uh, certainly in surgical care, but this also includes medical oncology and radiation oncology because nothing that we do here is done in a very specific one person, one person thing. It's always a multidisciplinary approach. And I think this is very good for the patient, this is good for the doctors because the doctors have the input from the different specialties. I think the fact is that a lot of places still around the country uh, women who are diagnosed with breast cancer end up seeing a breast surgeon or breast specialist or a general surgeon and that multidisciplinary approach doesn't come in. But here, as I said, in, at New York Presbyterian, at this Wild Cornell Breast Center site, we, we try to do that and we developed the breast center specifically so that we have the teams all available to us. The New York Presbyterian Hospital Wild Cornell Breast Center is set up to offer patients um, services that encompass the entire gamut of um, uh, uh, procedures and um, uh, referrals that they'll need uh, in dealing with uh, breast cancer um, and in, for, in patients that have a high risk for breast cancer. You have to have a whole team approach and there just aren't a lot of places that are set up to do this as it is for now. And on that basis, we do get patients uh, from other countries who fly in for this kind of surgery because they've heard about it. Uh, I think there are other places that are starting to do this around our country and in other parts of the uh, world. And I think that as, as more and more surgeons understand and get trained, uh, you're, you're going to see more of this kind of approach to breast cancer treatment. I think there are two issues um, for women, either who are at high risk for breast cancer or for those who have a diagnosis of breast cancer. And of course, one is related to the breast cancer because everyone is fearful of uh, illness and death, of course. Um, but the other is the fear of mutilation. And I think, um, again, I think when patients uh, go onto the internet and they might talk to their mother or grandmother, they might have seen their mother or grandmother who has had a mastectomy, and I think the images are so frightening and the um, uh, evolution in breast reconstruction is so extreme and so recent, I think, that patients are not... Um, uh, exposed to to newer images uh, of what breast reconstruction really looks like now and what what a patient who has had a mastectomy looks like now. The concept of using radical surgical techniques for cure of the cancer plus the addition of the cosmetic aspects of reconstruction is a unique idea and it comes under the name of oncoplasty. Uh, the oncoplasty is defined as the, the approach of onco which is the tumor and plasty is the idea of plastic surgery and putting that word together is where you're starting to hear more and more about this term because I think a lot of people are understanding again that this addition of approach is a plus for for the patients in terms of getting them past the surgery and minimizing scars. I think the message that I like to give patients all the time is that we can fix this because that's what people want to hear. People are devastated by a diagnosis of breast cancer as Cecilia was as well and you're trying to see, well, is this the end of my life? Is this the way everything's going to be different from now on? And I think one of the things we've tried to do here at, at uh, Cornell has been to say, well, wait a minute, yes, you've been diagnosed, and yes, you have this uh, potentially life-threatening problem, but we can take care of you. I had my first mammogram in London and didn't really think any more about it. I thought it's not as bad as I thought it would be and uh, didn't even feel alarmed when I was called back in two weeks later and had a second you know, round of mammograms and ultrasounds and everything changed. Suddenly I had a white-coated radiologist over my head saying, there are some calcifications in your left breast. Your right breast is great, but we want to biopsy those calcifications in the left. They're probably nothing, but we want to make sure. And I staggered out onto the streets, shell-shocked. I called my gynecologist who gave me the name of a breast surgeon. And I went to see him and he looked at the films and he said, yes, we need to biopsy this. And I had a serous vacuum assisted biopsy, which was brutal. It was a very deep set um, DCIS ductal carcinoma in situ. 
saw a precancer, a stage zero, that had not traveled anywhere yet, but it could have. So I opted for a first lumpectomy um, and was hoping that I would get it out that way. I had two young boys, um, so this is three years ago, and um, they were then, so they're 12 and 14, um, nine, yeah, nine and 11, it was intense. And I took them through it in a very lucid way. I told them that I'm incredibly lucky that they caught this potentially very sinister disease early. So let's celebrate that. And I went in for my first lumpectomy. Um, I had never been under, and I found that very intimidating. Um, and I had um, a pretty harsh anesthetist who didn't look me in the eye and just shoved the needle and put me under. And um, the next day they said, we didn't get it all. So we need to take your breast. And that's when it became serious. And that's when suddenly I remembered my grandmother with her teenage chest and her big lumpy arm for lymphedema. And I thought, oh my goodness, it's me. It's me, I'm 46, I'm sporty, I'm strong. I'm a mother and it's me. And I said, why don't we go for another lumpectomy? And, and the surgeon was not crazy about it. He said, you have a 50-50 chance. And I said, let's do it. And we did, and they didn't get it all. And that's when my husband uh, contacted his employers in New York and said, we have to level with you. Um, my wife is undergoing breast cancer surgery and uh, treatment. And they said, get her over here. We have some amazing people for her to meet. Cecilia came to us diagnosed with bilateral breast cancer. Uh, this was based on the fact that we were very careful when we have any person who's diagnosed with breast cancer. I think it makes a lot of sense to make certain that this is the only place or is there more disease or not because you don't want to be focused on one breast, for instance, and then find out that something else is, is going on. In, in Cecilia's case, what we did is we had the breast MRI. We also had an outstanding radiologist who spent a lot of time being careful on the other so-called healthy breast, and much to our amazement, we found early stage disease on that side. So with bilateral breast cancer and with her prior surgery, that had shown us that she really wasn't a good candidate for breast conservation on the one side, it, it became clear to us that her best option was bilateral. Hello. Hi. When I went back to London, after having met with Dr. Swistel, I um, basically turned my office into a kind of research, medical research library, and uh, went to investigate what was on offer in Europe, in France, in Russia, in Germany, in my native Norway and in the US. And um, every road led back to Alexander Swistel. The fact that he was one of the pioneers behind the single lymph node biopsy, or sentinel lymph node biopsy, um, which, which basically said, which basically invented um, the, well, the idea of taking one single lymph node while the patient is under, instead of the usual 2030 routinely. And this was linked to my memory of my grandmother with her painful log of an arm, you know, suffering silently for years with this double size, this walking around like this. I remember when he said, I'll take one. If I don't encounter, if I don't encounter any cancer cells in the first lymph node, well, then why go for more? And I thought that makes perfect sense. So he had that in his favor with me. Um, I liked the idea that he teamed up with a reconstructed surgeon. So I started looking at, at the um, Well Cornell Breast Cancer, no, Breast Center website and um, saw who he worked with and I got in touch with Mia Talmor, the young reconstructive surgeon that Swistel works with. And she sent me pictures of a woman my age with my frame before surgery right after surgery and six months later. And I was absolutely blown away. I mean, it looked beautiful. Cecilia had a um, very uh, novel, at the time, uh, approach to reconstruction in that instead of um, uh, using a multi-stage procedure and going through intermediate stages to achieve the end result, we did a single-stage procedure 
At the time of her mastectomy, we placed uh, implants, and in order to um, take advantage of the full um, preserved skin envelope uh, and to use implants that, that she would be happy with, we uh, added additional tissue, which is called a cellular dermal matrix. It's something we use for um, breast reconstruction um, that allows us to place bigger implants um, in, in uh, more precise locations, which really optimizes the cosmetic result that we can achieve with an implant-based reconstruction. We are offering her Cecilia this, what we call an inframammary approach, the incision actually underneath the breast, and through that incision underneath the breast, all of the breast tissue is removed, just as if it was a standard incision right across the chest. But this way, you minimize the scarring, and this has been a rather successful thing for us here. The two surgeons worked in less than four and a half hours with uh, Dr. Swistel doing the mastectomy and uh, Dr. Talmore putting in a silicone gel implants and along with human donated tissue, which is remarkable. It feels like it um, forms an internal bra, sits under the pectoral muscles, um, looks like thick white rice paper, and these little strips and layers are put in to cushion and um, kind of protect the implant, which means that I don't feel like I have artificial breasts. That's the most unbelievable thing, that I feel like myself. Sure, there, there is a replacement in here, but I am never aware of it. And um, those who love me and know me intimately say the same thing, would never have known that these are not your breasts. At the time of the mastectomy, we will um, uh, check the tissue that we plan to leave in place. So that's the skin of the nipple and areola are checked with pathologic exam to make sure that there are no abnormal cells and, and certainly no um, cancer cells uh, that would remain in the skin of the breast, which is one of our major concerns with um, clearing the, the cancer on oncologically. You know, for me, um, the key to my speedy recovery was very much uh, early detection, meaning that I was spared chemotherapy, radiation, or even hormone treatment like tamoxifen. I'm a sensitive, sensitive uh, woman, and I know it would have been taking a real toll on my body, so I think part of certainly what you and Dr. Talmore achieved for me uh, physically was vital, but also psychologically and emotionally to have early detection meant that I didn't have to go through that that ordeal afterwards. Chemo, the early detection makes all the difference. It makes my, my uh, ability to treat people a lot easier mm -hmm. and they don't have to go through all the very radical techniques of radiation and, and chemotherapy. Those, those things are, are sometimes very devastating, worse than even the surgery sometimes. I think uh, Cecilia was overwhelmed, but hesitant. You know, I think when you've been bombarded with all that information and a lot of negativity before getting here, waking up the next morning looking great and feeling great, um, it's sometimes too good to be true, and I think you're still very nervous for the first week or so after surgery that something will go wrong or something will happen. And I think um, by the time she left New York, which I think was two weeks after her original surgery, um, she was just overwhelmed and, and absolutely uh, delighted. And I think um, really, um, while she was hoping for a great result and a great outcome, I, I think that her, um, her feeling was that um, her, her outcome had completely um, exceeded her expectations. It is amazing. It is unbelievable that um, a woman of 46 who has breastfed two boys can suddenly, <laughs> through a initially sinister diagnosis, end up with kind of 19-year-old perky breasts. That is quite unbelievable and um, a, lovely, a lovely single, you know, silver lining, a lovely silver lining to a potentially very uh, sad story. It had a very happy ending. And it has boosted my sense of femininity, for sure. Cecilia has done very well in terms of follow-up. Generally speaking, when you've had a mastectomy, 
some of the diagnostic imaging, that is mammograms, MRIs, that are often used in patients who have breast tissue still there, it is just a non-issue here. Uh, there's no mammography in this kind of a situation. Uh, MRIs are often used not just to look for breast tissue, but sometimes if patients have had implants, oftentimes we want to see if the implant is still in good position. So it's really, that's the reason for having an MRI on a periodic basis. Now I come once a year for a checkup, but I have not had any complications of any kind uh, since surgery. Eight weeks after surgery, I was back in Hyde Park roller skiing. And I always think when I hit those roller skis with my Czechs and Russian colleagues, if I had had the latissimus dorsi in my left breast from, from, the, from the left side of my back, and then maybe years later, having discovered the right one, I would have had no back muscle. How would I be able to ski or do anything physical? I mean, my heart goes out to women who have to maim their own body to get um, reconstruction. I think it's uh, cruel, I think it's hard. It's what um, Dr. Swistel called the medieval shark bite. It leaves a very deep, long scar and, um, and a very, very long, painful recovery time. And I didn't have that. And I'm very grateful for that, that I didn't have to spend time in recovery for more than um, maybe 10 days of, of intense healing. Beyond that, no pain whatsoever of any kind. I find that amazing. I mean, I have replaced my chest. It's, um, it's, it's pretty staggering, pretty impressive that I haven't had a single tweak or discomfort since then. Typically, we, we'd like to see patients every six months uh, initially and certainly every year. So for our patients who are overseas, we try to um, meet up with them at least once a year. Um, for patients who really can't make it back to the States uh, yearly or um, uh, for whatever reason prefer to stay overseas, we'll contact colleagues overseas and, and do some follow-up with them and, and of course they'll keep in touch with us with respect to the patient's care. Um, and finally, um, we do a lot of communication uh, via email and over the internet. And particularly from the standpoint of the plastic surgery, um, pictures help a lot. So if a patient has a question with respect to um, something related to appearance or um, uh, anything at all that might show up on pictures, they'll send me a picture and then we can communicate that way with pictures. As we attract more and more international patients, we understand that it is a lot more difficult for them to have access to a one-on-one -on -one personal basis of uh, interviews, or even physical exams. Although I must say that with the new technology that we have, uh, this is re really remarkably changing, even as we speak. I had a recent interview with a patient on Skype from Istanbul. And it was uh, on, uh, her sister came into the office and had an iPad and essentially we conducted the whole interview on the iPad with this patient who was having chemotherapy and she was interested in this uh, type of uh, nipple sparing approach that we were doing. And it was fascinating to me because I could see that she could see me. We had this conversation going back and forth and she was there very comfortable and, and <laughs> miles and miles away. And a lot of the questions we were able to answer for her it was almost on a personal basis. I know it sounds a little odd, but but it, I think that as, as technology continues to improve, people's idea of communication is changing. And so it's okay almost to, to have that kind of communication pattern, including things like um, inter internet access and email access and you know, all with the patient's uh, permission, of course. And I think that this is a way of imparting information. We can also send uh, some of the work that we've done, and there's brochures that can be downloaded off the internet for the patients, and, and so they, they get a lot of information this way now, no, much more so than ever before. So that by the time they do actually come in to see one of us here at the breast center, uh, we already have a lot of information on them, and they have a lot of information on us, because it works both ways.